And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, creator of the Gaia Complex, now now in development... Ah, development of its expansion, Hardware 2119. And a man, and a man who's, who is a self who is a self-proclaimed Pokemon master when he when he isn't um, refurbishing the reputation of the D12. The one and only Chris Shepperson. How you doing today, man? I'm really good, thank you. Thanks for asking me to uh, come back and uh, take part in these festivities again. Oh yeah. So. It's it's certainly it's certainly been a it's certainly been a hot minute. The last time I had you on was when we was when we were on the cusp of the release of um the of the Gaia complex. Mm -hmm. And nah, and now you now we're now um with this I think I think hardware 2019 was an expansion that you had you had pe you had pegged that you were going that you were going to do, but was a lot of it is a lot of did a lot of it start as just things that you couldn't put that you didn't have enough room to put in the core book yeah so this is a really good question yeah absolutely um the first chapter of hardware 2119 is not surprisingly uh, a hardware catalog mm -hmm. and um at the moment that stretches to around 50 pages 54 pages um of laid out content and i reckon probably 20 to 30 pages of that i had written with a view to put it in the core book um but simply realized how large the core book was getting and you know with spiraling costs um it was becoming something i had to I had to strip it back and we we put the 288 page limit on the core book to make sure that we could do it swiftly and within budget so um yeah i guess we got a little kickstart of our own into this into this book having sort of almost 30 pages of content written before we we put our brains together and, and started actually working on it mm -hmm. um everything else that's in here is stuff that i had absolutely wanted to do but i didn't really have plans to put it into the core book it was just if we get to make a source book this stuff goes in the first source book that was always the kind of vibe behind it yeah and cyberpunk games are no are no stranger to what I've to what I've called toy box expansions. Mm -hmm. um, with, and if, whether that be whether that be the whether that be the augmented book in um oh, no it was Arsenal not augmented what am I saying in um, Shadowrun with which the fourth edition cover had the most ugliest <laughs> the ugliest cover art that I've se that I had seen. <laughs> Um, or the or the myriad of books that that have handled just equipment in um in other in other stuff like cyberpunk. Was originally what originally was it go, was it going to be just was the idea for hardware twenty nineteen just to be a expansion of wep of weapons and cyberware. I have. I've lost you. You started to fade out and go all robot-like. Uh, d oh, damn it! Not again. And we are back. Sorry about sorry about that. Blamed it. Blame Discord, folks, for the pause you're gonna see. You're gonna see in the recording. But um, I think I think we talked. One of the things that I saw on the ki on the Kickstarter that that kind of opens the thing up is the bl is the black market, which <laughs> I think if I if I recall correctly is present in is present in the core book but not gone in but not extensively detailed. So I think I think that is a that is a good angle to really to really open with. Yeah, sure. We we the main. Um sort of insight to the black market in the core book is actually through some of the playable character types. Mm -hmm. 
mainly the tech trader and the data dealer. So there are two archetypes which effectively start the game with stolen goods or stolen knowledge, and you effectively are a, a dealer of your item of choice. And there's a little insight in how we describe those characters um, into how the kind of black market works. But we, we, we kind of plant the seed and allow the GM to kind of imagine maybe what, what those transactions um hardware 2119 has given us the chance to really delve into that um and we have a we effectively have a substantial chapter dedicated to it mm. that breaks down um each of the various um forms of illegal commerce and gives you a good dive into kind of what the state of play is with them what kind of values are attached to things how illegal it is in the eyes of the law and also for each of those um sort of types of uh, of black market commerce we also give you a few uh well, what's what we've called the most wanted list so we give you a couple of kind of key people that operate in those circles um and a little bit of an insight into um their character their personality and what kind of stuff they get involved in again information to inspire gms to roll these kind of notorious characters into into their games mm -hmm. and i'm get i'm guessing when it comes to those most wanted you'll do you, do you um do you have a few do you have a few story seeds with the, with them as far as how a gm might be able to integrate them into a campaign yeah absolutely they've um they so the, the book has uh, a number of data seeds in it which is a kind of concept that we we coined in the quick start and the and the core book so there are sort of one page uh adventure overviews and um e each of the write-ups for people on the most wanted list have e enough flavor to get an idea of what they're involved in and how you might roll those characters uh into them but also a couple of those people uh, exist within the the fiction of the guy complex both from the core book and from uh, the continued fiction in Hardware 2119. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the uh, data seeds that are included in the book also tie back to content in that black market chapter, be it uh, events or uh, some of those characters, um, giving you the opportunity to kind of throw the, the player characters into, um, in you know, directly into the world of that black market that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Now... I'm get, and I'm guessing, I'm guessing within the, within the within the equipment setup, there's you you'll have a, you'll have a spot about the, the legality of of certain of certain weapons and what might be what might be pushing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and some of that is touched on in the core book. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of make a, I guess, a few blanket statements that explain that while most firearms are uh, legal. Um, uh, anything that's classed as a heavy weapon and anything which has explosive properties are strictly forbidden, as well as any uh, weapons that are built and marketed specifically as anti-vampire uh, weaponry. So anything along those lines are illegal and obviously fetch a higher price on the black market. Um, but that's pretty much as far as the, con the information about that side of things went in the core book. Um, in Hardware 2119, we go a little bit deeper into explaining why those things are outlawed and the implications of being caught in possession of them, how hard they are to find, um, and, and a few little, few different little bits and pieces which um, gives both players and, and GMs a kind of reason to obtain those items or avoid them like the plague, depending on your sort of stance on the outcome. I do want to t I do want to touch on the idea of a of anti vampire weapons, because mm -hmm. um, I think a lot I think a lot of people when they hear that kind of concept they're thinking of the class they're thinking of the classics you know, mm -hmm. um, holy holy water running water stakes crosses garlic silver yep. um, EDTA if you're if you're a fan of the Blade movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which inc incidentally, I'm, surpri I'm surprised. No, I'm surprised people don't use that more often. Uh, but yeah, yeah. In but obviously, since vampire, the way vampires are utilized in the Gaia complex, 
is not in the is not in the traditional sense. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious what anti-vampire weaponry it would entail. Okay. Oh, well, um, there's only ever been two weapons that have been highly commercially available. Um, so it's easiest to discuss those two. One is, a, and they're both made by the same manufacturer, mm -hmm. uh, a company called MB and C, who have got quite a large amount of information provided about them in this in this new book. Um, so one of them uh, fires small. Um, one is a handgun, and it fires small capsules of sulfur extract, which is extracted from uh, a kind of um, cloned version of garlic because uh, most plants won't grow naturally anymore in uh, in the metropolis um the the process of extracting that um chemical compound is basically nobody else has figured out how to recreate that mm -hmm. so that is one version of the weapon uh, of the of the weaponry the other one is in, a, in i guess in a traditional sense vampires don't like getting uh penetrative damage from wooden weaponry unfortunately wood is exceptionally rare there's basically no greenery left in um in the metropolis and um artificial atmospheric processing is basically what generates the air now and um bar the very wealthy people having pre-war wooden furniture in their houses everything else is metal or composite um, and so the um, MB and C, this company, have a small private forest of spruce mm -hmm. that they have behind a 12 foot steel wall under heavy guard. And they still operate, they still maintain this forest now, even though m the only real purpose that they, they set it up was to make wooden tip munitions for weapons. Um, which are now not allowed to do, but they're obviously keeping it for some reason or another, which you may or may not learn about when you when you read the new book. Mm -hmm. So wooden tipped um, munitions was the other the other way to go. Interestingly, on the black market, the the, the two weapons that they um, they manufactured are not actually that hard to obtain because whilst they were supposed to have been recalled, um, they they made a lot before the recall. Um, so you can get hold of the weapon, however. The ammunition costs a small fortune, and um, currently, uh, creating your own version of those two munition types is nigh on impossible. So there's a serious premium that dealers will charge if they can obtain uh, ammunition for either of those weapon types. Yeah, and now one of the one of the other things that's one of the other things that's mentioned on the Kickstarter that I that I wanted to touch on further is the introduction of what you call ghost tax suits. So mm -hmm. what, exa what exactly is that, and what does that bring to the table? Cool, yeah. So there's a little section on these, and you're also going to get some some very nice artwork, which is being worked on at the moment, that we're hopefully going to be showing off before the end of the, of the campaign. Mm -hmm. So Ghost Tech Industrial are a company who entered the marketplace as a... Um, pro providing modern alternatives to construction industry vehicles mm -hmm. um, and they are effectively um, if we put it in its simplest terms they're they're mechs okay so they're quite small scale i think more like the power loader from aliens in a in a more industrial setting mm -hmm. and there are there are three commercial models one is uh small a bit bigger than an exoskeleton designed for carrying heavy weights around a building site Another it, it has a sort of shoulder-mounted crane and is designed for kind of more general building purposes. And then there's a big one designed for demolition, which has you know huge hands and pushes over walls and de demolishes buildings. Mm -hmm. And these are sold through the use of a extremely clever marketing campaign to be for the construction industry. Not surprisingly. Uh, number of criminals and merc teams have already found out ways on how to weaponize um, suits like this. Yeah. And so we, you get the rules for them in view of what they're designed for um, and the kind of places that you might find them. And then you also have the rules for modifying the system to enable it to mount weaponry and be used 
um, in a more brutal manner. Mm. Um, and they're they're nice. They're, they're expensive. They're not the sort of thing you're going to easily pick up in a you know nip out to the shop and buy one. But if you know how to pilot one, you've got some experience in that kind of industry, then um, you know it's the kind of thing you might find in a construction site you know throughout the metropolis and uh you know it's a new toy for people to to kind of throw into the havoc mm -hmm. and uh, or for, and i'm pretty i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure somebody i'm pretty sure somebody who like who likes swimming in code might have might have some fun might have some fun at people's expense with it <laughs> yeah, quite possibly mm -hmm. uh and the other th the other thing that I did that I did want to go into is if I'm not if I'm not mistaken you plan you're planning on going into a bit of detail on Neo Munich. Yes. Because there there was there was plenty obviously there was plenty of um of set of setting material in the co in the core book but it was a very broad it was a very broad stroke kind of thing just going over the just going over the metropolises and the Gaia complex not mm -hmm. necessarily um oh not necessarily one particular area yeah so yeah in the um, in the core book for for new year in the description of new europe we kind of picked out i think there's half a dozen key locations and we kind of gave them a paragraph each just to add some flavor um in this uh, release we've got a couple of uh, pages dedicated to Neo Munich, and as well as a uh, as a map of the area, mm -hmm. and um, Neo Munich's important, and it is mentioned a lot in the core book in the in the in the law. It's important because it's it's kind of referred to as the Merc hunting ground. So, generally speaking, most game sessions will start in Neo Munich. If you're looking for a Merc to take on, you know, some corporate sabotage or you know, employ them for almost anything, the place to look is Neo Munich. The police presence there is very low because there's an awful lot of uh, uh, combat situations that the police are going to get themselves into. They're going to get a lot of pushback. So they kind of give the area quite a wide berth. They much prefer to just kind of stop the, the violence flowing out of Neo Munich rather than try and stop it at its source. Mm -hmm. So it's the place where a lot of illegal commerce happens, and and in many respects, it would be considered the home of the black market simply because of that fact. Mm -hmm. um, and there are another, there are a number of other fairly important things that make Neo Munich um, kind of vital in terms of its position and its connectivity to other areas, um, and that's all kind of covered in the in the chapter. But there's a, there's a few um, there's a few things that explain why the black markets thrived there so much. And uh, also, why there's a prominence of goods from certain corporations on the street, and, and how that's come to be. We we go into a bit more of the the fluff about about the place, where to find what what the police presence is like, what kind of corporations exist or are silly enough to try and set up shop in in Neo Munich, and kind of what the outskirts and the industrial sectors look like. And um, yeah, I think it's quite a useful addition. Uh, especially when you know a lot of games that I've seen on live streams and stuff, they seem to centre around that area. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's uh, I think it, it's we've kind of done it justice to just kind of flesh that out a little bit. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it, getting to the getting to the weapons, because I'd say th there's a reason why I call Source was like th like this the toy box. Um, Obvious, obviously, de dealing with a lot of weapons, there, there's that means a lot of fire. That means a lot of firearms. Um, mm -hmm. Are the firearms that are going to be in the book going to largely fall into the same um, six categories that were in the core book, or are there any new categories to keep an eye out for? Um, we've stuck to the same categories, so we've kind of pigeonholed weapons to be pistols, submachine guns, shotguns, assault rifles, etc. Uh, but there is some new technologies utilized within those categories. In, there's also um, a substantial new player on the marketplace that goes about developing their weapons technology very differently. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you've got the same categories, but you do have some um, some very new toys in the way that they function uh, within the game. Yeah. 
Um, and since since you mentioned some differences in how in function, could you give me a couple examples? Obviously, we we can't go through all of them because then we'd be here all day, but just a few highlights. Yeah. So I mean, I guess the um, the biggest ones are there are three weapons from a new uh, manufacturer called Talking Industries, mm -hmm. and they are to put it in a more in a bluntish sense they basically take if you, if you consider dire arms to be the big weapons manufacturer of the setting mm -hmm. they kind of take all of their ideas and then reverse engineer them and then decide what else they can stick on top and in the case of the talking weaponry they come with like onboard analytic systems they work out how you use the weapon to suggest more opportune reload points um, to suggest how you adjust your grip and um, muscle memory when using the weapon. And they also collect user data and they have this kind of social portal where you can kind of like illegally share kill shots with other people. And they are rolling out things like subscription models where it uh, tracks when you're running to a certain threshold and ammunition and they'll kind of get a delivery to you and stuff like that. So there's a lot of um, sort of uh, digital interfacing with the talking weaponry, and it opens up quite a few kind of like quite interesting options, not only for the people using those weapons, but also from the kind of hacking sense, mm -hmm. where there's all these new networks and things that are not quite as simple as a, a corporate mainframe or um, you know a database that you're trying to get into. There's also all this huge, huge amount of biometric data and and user data out there for, for you know, combat systems. But that's probably the really big new way of working in the book. Um, and it's quite exciting. Like, we've had a lot of fun with, with messing around with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And within, the, within that, I'm, I'm curious if, there is, if there's any new keywords to keep in, to keep in mind when it comes to uh, weaponry. Uh, yeah, no, we there isn't. Um, I, we did play around with um, kind of expanding the fire modes, uh, particularly on the talking weapons, beyond um, the kind of burst and sort of full auto, and, but burst and suppressive options. But um, uh, something that we actually played around with. But I. Ended up just sitting back a little bit from the from the project after I'd kind of written most of the book and realizing that at its at its heart the guy complex's rule system is really quite streamlined, mm -hmm. and I decided that more rules was not really the way to um, to make these different. The best way to make this different was through the way that we describe them. Uh, the the whole ethos of the game is to plant seeds with people and let them generate the rest of the world around it. So we decided to keep the rules relatively light um, and not kind of bog down things that would uh, be considered core rules. We want everybody able to be able to play the game without needing to learn an entire new set of rules beyond the core book. So yeah, we've, we've kind of kept things to burst suppressive, single shot, and um, the kind of keywords and, um, and optional rules that you saw in the core book. And in that same vein, when it comes to obviously, obviously with with ranged weapons, that's get, that's getting a fair bit of expansion. Um, are mm -hmm. melee weapons getting getting a getting expanded as well, to a degree? Yeah, there's a not not so much, but yes, there is. Um, there's a few new blades and melee weapons within the book, and there's um, a new manufacturer who's. Stuff is, I guess we could say, exceptionally high end, um, and there's a little bit of a focus on them. Um, there's an image of one of their um, blades on the Kickstarter campaign, like a very pretty colour. And so basically, they are they use a um, a new a, a proprietary material which is called a edge glass, and they're semi-transparent blade technology, and effectively. If, if I was to sum it up without kind of getting into the gritty, they basically uh, are more likely to cause um, intense bleeding and they are more likely to damage armor when they make a strike. Mm -hmm. So they're exceptionally sharp and exceptionally expensive. 
uh, blades from a, a new a new manufacturer. Mm-hmm. And speaking of, speaking of that speaking of that, uh, since it, since it talks about doing a doing a dive into some of the into some of the companies, are there any are there any um, new corporations? Um, to keep to keep an eye out on, to keep an eye out on, on that hardware 2119 is going to be discussing yeah there is that we 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 followed uh, so the corporations discussed in it follow one or two formats one follows much like the corps in the core book so we kind of have a half a page summary of what those corporations are like what they're up to what they do and then there's also a a very a much more in-depth deep dive into four key corporations, specifically corporations that are involved in in the weapons trade, mm-hmm. uh, where we go um, into um, what they do, what their public image is like, what their shady secrets are, what R&D they're working on, and who the key figures are within the company. A bit like the most wanted list in the black market chapter, we kind of give a big in- insight to the people that are either running this company or working on R&D. Um, but a couple of these, um, a couple of these companies that we discuss in this book are uh, wrapped up within the overarching story of the Gaia complex. And we've already mentioned Tarkin Industries and their digital interfacing weapons. They are one of the companies that gets a uh, a big insight. But there's also another company that's worth. Um, keeping an eye on and while we specifically and deliberately don't go into extreme detail about them there's a commercial software developer called Harrowtech who if you've scoured the core book and read the whole thing you will find them mentioned in there as an easter egg Mm -hmm. and they're circled back to in this book and there are a few little nods in the black market chapter to some rumours circulating around that company's involvement in um, uh, in the development of biohacking software, mm-hmm. so um, yeah, we 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 are continuing the process of planting seeds to grow in the following release, if that makes sense. Yeah, I I can certainly get that. And I'm, I'm guessing that even with even with that sense of continuity, um, there's a bit of care taken to make sure that you guys don't fall into the meta plot problem that. Has plagued certain has plagued certain other cyberpunk games, um, mm-hmm. in ter- in terms of just ma- of making so- of having so much detail in the setting that it's hard for pe- for people to figure out where their where their particular characters are going to fit into into the grand scheme. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we 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 definitely have a meta plot, and we and there's something that we discussed in our our call before. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we did with the core book is we were very careful to uh, tell the story through the fiction of, you know, the, the setting of that meta plot, and pretty much give it uh, um, almost an ending at the uh, at the end of the book. So there's not it's not left so open that you don't need to. You're like, okay, I need the next book now because I need to know what's happening. It's not a novel series. It's uh, it's a bit of a closed case, mm-hmm. and. This book, I've used the short fiction sections to continue the stories of the characters that we developed um, and and pay homage to the meta plot, but not to add more twists and more turns and make it more complicated. Because I think, you know, it's it's pretty enough in the in the core book. And it's nice to know that it's still here and it's still a part of the world. And that we do have a bit more to tell in that story, but it's certainly something that you don't need to know anything about to enjoy the game. And I think uh, Hardware Twenty One Nineteen makes it quite clear that we are not looking to make that story more complicated. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it kind of begins and ends with the core book, and if we can just give you a little bit of additional excitement on top of that, that's the plan. Uh, there is actually um, a small section I've put in the in the GM Tools chapter for this book which basically is titled the meta plot mm. and answers that question was we have we have had some backers say if i really wanted to roll the meta plot of this game into my games if i wanted to get the players involved in that story how would i do it and um 
uh, I just wanted to address that question in a publication because other people might have that question as well. So we do, we tackle it head on and we, you know, we, we kind of give you a bit of an insight into that in there as well. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in, with that in mind, um, there's also, there's also talk of, of a few, of a few new, a few new skills and some GM tools. I do want to focus on the, um, skills part of that first. So mm -hmm. what skit, what, um, what skit, what skills would be added to it? And I, and I can see this being one of the easy, one of the semi easier things to implement just because of the way attributes and skills have their relationship in your system. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this will be the first time that we've announced this as well. I was saving this for a Kickstarter update, but I'll give you the scoop. Mm -hmm. So, um, we have introduced one additional skill per, uh, statistic. So there are a total of six new skills in the book. Um, basically one of them had to be in here really. And that is pilot ghost tack. Mm -hmm. So the ability to drive pilot and operate the ghost tack suits that we discussed earlier on. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have, um, under reflexes, we have sleight of hand for pickpocketing and street performance. Um, under guts, we have disguise, um, which is something that we actually had a couple of people in the Facebook community group say, "What skill should I use if my people are trying to, dis you know, conceal themselves in that sense?" So the people were crying for that skill, so we we put it in. Mm -hmm. um, under brains, we've got occult, which is basically. Um, predominantly covers knowledge of vampire hierarchy both um the vampires integrated with human life and the outsiders so it'll be knowledge of the um the various blood syndicates which are all discussed in this book um it's effectively a way for humans to have more of an insight into uh vampire and feral communities mm -hmm. uh under law we have perform so if you want to do your classic rocker boy thing, mm -hmm. um, it's in there. The suggestion before was to use the kind of uh, persuasion skill, but it felt like it was something that wouldn't hurt to have its own place. People that really want to play that. And I guess it's a, an archetype which, um, which fits nicely within the setting. You know, if you read any cyberpunk fiction, it's obviously a very common thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was an important one for us. And then under perception, we have uh, lip reading um, as well, which is uh, predominantly kind of there for uh, the kind of feral data dealer and the spy to go alongside, um, you know, those people looking to put together a sort of surveillance skill package. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when it comes to, G when it comes to the GM tools, um, is, I guess the I guess this is a roundabout way of of asking: Is the GM going to have more tables? <laughs> just for, no, just for... no. The GM is not going to have more tables. Um, I, I'm not one for you know like random encounters and um. Let, the guy come. Obviously, I want other people to put this game on the table and play it and love it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's also. Uh, is an indie RPG from a small team and a very much a passion project. And because of that, I've been able to write and create a game, I guess you could say almost selfishly. And I am not a fan of lots of tables. So uh, I wouldn't want them in my books that I read. So I'm like, nah, I'm not going to yeah. put them in this as few table as possible. Yeah, it's, I was I was admittedly being facetious, and obviously, even though even though I enjoy a bit of randomness, I don't want I don't want the I don't want the table hell that it that has bet that is rampant with some of my whipping boys. Um, because I, I already told you how I keep pick how I will keep picking on Phoenix Command until the cows come home. <laughs> but yeah, man, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I I I just yeah no tables are a. Uh... The, the core book has as no, enough tables as it needs, and mainly they're just to break down core rules. Um, GMs-wise, we have the new skills, mm -hmm. and the, the GM chapter also has um, 
a whole pile of new data seeds and a uh, uh, two sections on new ways to use both experience points and to use grit uh, within within the game. Mm -hmm. And using using ex new ways to use experience points is an interesting is an interesting prospect. Um, <clears throat> especially sent especially given the given the free form manner in which you in which you use experience um, mm -hmm. although and espe especially since well in this kind of setup you could you could reasonably get away with the whole spending experience on cer on certain powerful light on certain powerful equipment unlike say a certain other fantasy game where the, where the idea of spending it to get to get magic items was nonsensical mm -hmm. yeah the, uh, the there are there are two new ways to use experience mm -hmm. within the game um, one of them is um, the fir the first way is that if you can dedicate a, one character in a group can dedicate themselves as a teacher and another person in the group can be dedicated as a student and effectively a, the teacher is able to you, during the downtime periods between games over a multi-game session over a campaign is able to use their experience to increase the experience gain of other characters providing uh, the time and the lessons go well. Mm. So it's a way to um, selflessly transfer experience with a possible chance to gain a little more, um, but only if you are prepared to dedicate the required resources to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other way is that you can use experience after a session to secure a long-term contact of an NPC or valuable person that you dealt with during the previous game session, providing that the interaction with them was was positive. So experience can be spent to uh, represent the time spent on investing in that rapport and relationship. And the, uh, the player and the GM will then work out what that NPC can bring to the team whether they can be a hired gun for them, whether they'll provide them information. Mm. Um, so it, it provides you the process by which to use experience for that and then provides um, guidance on how to work it out as best suits your group as to the actual outcome of it. Mm -hmm. Now, within, within, within that, you, you're, you mentioned data seeds and... As I as I understand it, with each with the data seeds that you have planned with this one, there's going they're going to be done by guest writers. Um, yeah. And was it even w even with that? I'm get I'm guessing that a lot of the coordination for making sure for making sure that the that the data seeds are still internally consistent um, fall, falls falls back to you obviously, but when when um. When you were bringing people in to do these data seeds, did you provide them with a kind of setting bible, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, everybody that's writing a um, data seed for us has uh, been armed with the core book content, mm -hmm. as well as the three digital data seed releases that we've put out over the last 12 months on Drive Through RPG. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they also got, a, like you suggested, a small setting Bible, content Bible. And um, the basic instruction was um, give me a pitch for your story. And that's mainly just so I can make sure it's not too similar to an existing data seed. Mm -hmm. And then just go wild with it. You stick within the confines. Uh, I, I kind of remain, I guess you could say, like line editor on the, uh, on the book at the end. Um, so if there's any stitching together needs to be done, you know, I can, I can help out with that. But so far, um, I've, you know, I've had a couple of these guest data seeds back already and they've, they've been really on point, like everything I could have hoped for, you know, and it's really great to see 
um, uh, a similar, you know, people have written within the voice of the system. So similar, but, but also different voicing of content. And I think that's been, that's been, it's been really fun. And I'm really excited, um, to, you know, to see the next couple come in as well. Yeah. I think, um, uh, if we, um, there are a couple of data seeds that are in here anyway. Um, and they were written by, um, Bart Weinitz and um, Matt Jones, who have both previously done a data seed in the digital date, the small data seeds releases. And I really wanted them to just do a couple more of them. Cause I really like the way that they, they form their stories. Mm -hmm. Um, so we had, we had like, uh, three or four data seeds in this book before we kind of went to the guest writers through stretch goals. If we unlock all of them, um, then I think we will end up with, uh, 10 data seeds in this book. So 10 pages of adventure in the, in the book. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? I know that there, I know that stretch goals might at might mess around with the page count. So do you have a ballpark number for me? Yeah, sure. Well, we, uh, we set out from the campaign at uh, 112 pages and we've unlocked a, a few more. I, I, um, I'm, I would like to think that we'll hit 128 pages, um, if things continue to go how they are at the moment. Um, then I think 128 pages for the source book is probably what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Well, we're, um, we we're making really good time on this one. I mean, we, we were, we wanted to be realistic on the Kickstarter. So we basically said sort of just after next Christmas, um, be, simply because at the moment, you know, global freight and, um, and we were a little late delivering to the U S on our plans for our first campaign, simply because what we thought was going to be a four week process to move the stock, uh, ended up becoming like, uh, I think it was just over 10 weeks. Um, just sea freight just stopped and then things sat in port at Detroit, I think maybe mm -hmm. they sat in port in the U S for like four weeks waiting for a truck to pick them up. And it was all a bit, it was out of my hands, but it was painful. And so, but realistically, I mean, I, um, pending any stretch goals, I've pretty much finished all the writing on the book. Um, I'm waiting on some guest data seeds to be returned and then I've got an editing pass to do and bits and pieces, but basically the book content is 98% done now. Mm. Um, artwork wise, we're in a really good place as well. We've got quite a bit of artwork still to show off over the next couple of weeks on the campaign that's already done. And, uh, Jesus is working on some pretty awesome, uh, ghost hack uh, images alongside the big two page spread that we started showing off on, on the last update. So I reckon there's a good couple of months worth of artwork, uh, still, but it's not, uh, I'm fairly confident that we are going to publish ahead of our, um, estimated date. I mean, I would like to think that it's not unreasonable that people would have the book two to three months before we, said they'd have the book uh which in the current climate if i can pull that off i think is pretty good mm -hmm. but that's my plan I, I want i want everyone to have the book before christmas so i'm hoping i'm pitching for november all right and i will i will certainly be keeping a close eye on its development to see to see where think where things go and what and what sort of shenanigans are born from it <clears throat> but with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come back to the temple and enjoy the particular brand of insanity that happens around here. Oh, no, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, I can't believe it's been, and it's got to be the best part of a, of a year almost since we, we chatted about the core book. Um, time flies, you know. Um, it's, been, it's been great, great to be back. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind.
And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>